what if integrating a motor were the easiest part of your project? Join me while I explore motor design and try and convince you that this janky robot chassis is cooler than it looks. All of these projects have one thing in common. The motor sticks out like a sore thumb. My poor design skills certainly contribute to the problem, but some of the issue comes down to the motor design itself. This spinning shaft comes out of the middle of the motor, right next to the mounting holes, which forces me to put the motor on the opposite side of a mounting plate from the rest of my drivetrain. To make matters worse, this shaft is only supported on one end, and the right way to attach it is to have another shaft supported by two bearings with a shaft coupler to connect it to the motor. Most of the time, I ignore that best practice, but the point remains, why is this so complicated? And is there a better way? To understand the problem, we'll start by reviewing the evolution of electric motors. The first motors used electromagnets for their entire operation. A ring of stationary coils produced a static magnetic field, and then internal coils would spin to align with that field. This requires rotating electrical contacts to pass current into the spinning component of the motor. The design uses the rotation to its advantage by separating those rotating contacts in order to alternate the direction of current through the internal coils and create continuous rotation. Those rotating contacts are called a commutator and the static portion are brushes. These are high-speed, low-torque motors, so they are generally coupled with gearboxes to reduce their speed and increase their torque. The next evolution was using permanent magnets to replace the stationary electromagnet coils. This improved efficiency, but the concept of operation remained essentially the same, because the commutator and brushes were still necessary to alternate the current through the remaining coils. Eventually, improvements in electronics created the possibility of electrically alternating the current direction, rather than relying on mechanical components. This allowed motor designers to swap the positions of the coils and the magnets. Now the coils are stationary on the outside, and the permanent magnets are rotating in the middle. These brushless motors are frequently used as more robust drop-in replacements for old brushed motors. Finally, building on the flexibility of brushless motors, some motors flipped the coils and the magnets again, but this time the central coils are stationary and the ring of magnets rotates. This creates higher torque, lower speed motors, which require little to no additional gear reductions, depending on the application. But why do these motors with static internal coils still have a central rotating shaft? I think it's because of this long history of motors having stationary casings and tiny spinning shafts. And I think we can do better. This is a frameless motor. It has the coils and the magnets, but none of the other structure, which leaves us free to experiment. Let's head to CAD to see what we can do. Here's our motor, and a central post which won't spin. Then we need bearings to attach to our spinning components. Putting a bearing on both the top and the bottom will mean that we can actually apply lateral force to this motor. And I'm going to incorporate a timing belt into my motor bell. The bell is in two halves for assembly. So this is the basic concept, but there are more details to make this actually work. For one, we need a spacer to keep the entire motor bell from falling down. It needs to be a separate part so the motor is assemblable. Then we need caps to keep the bell from splitting apart. I'm taking advantage of 3D printing to make these parts easier to align and assemble. The cone shape both helps with alignment and reduces the overhang to make printing easier. Next up is the mounting hole. A countersunk through hole should be all we need. Last, we need a way for the motor wires to escape. I'm using fairly small bearings, which probably makes this the trickiest part of the design. Printing isn't the best idea for motors, but for this proof of concept, it's good enough. After a reprint or three to fix tolerances, we have our parts. 
I think this concept of a motor with a solid central post needs a name. I'm going to call it a static core motor. Overall, the assembly went pretty smoothly. Everything fit together, and the motor bell spins nicely. Putting a belt on it, you can see the belt fits and spins the motor just the way we want. Later, I went back and hot glued the wires into their channel. I made a second motor off camera so we can have two drive wheels. This RC receiver isn't the point of the project. The important thing is just that it lets me wiggle some joysticks to make the motor spin. With the motors ready to go, it's time to build our robot chassis. I have some wheels, axles, and bearings left over from other projects, so we just need a couple of parts to hold them all together. The only thing requiring actual design here is the axles. We need to connect the rotating parts to the stationary parts, so this is always going to take a little effort. Sometimes when I'm working in CAD, I make up the dimensions as I go. Then I come back later with calipers, measure the components, and update the dimensions. If these parts look slightly different than what you'll see in a moment, that's why. These wheels don't really go with this axle, so I also need a wheel hub. Is this more effort than it's worth? Probably. Am I only doing this because of how many of you liked and subscribed after the last video? Definitely. If you'd like to see more maximum effort shenanigans, you know what to do. Okay, time to assemble our chassis. These scrap one by ones are perfect. We can attach the axle, slip on the timing belt, and screw in the motor, making sure we're holding tension on the belt. That was by far the easiest time I've ever had installing a belt drive. A quick repeat on the other side, and our drivetrain is all done. Now we have to connect the two sides together, and we have a complete chassis. Keeping with the theme of this example, I'm just going to tape down the electronics. I had a 50-50 chance of these motors spinning the same direction, so naturally they spun opposite directions and I had to swap some wires. I don't recommend copying this design. These motors are too weak to get off the starting line. If I give them a running start, the chassis can get out of frame, but that's about all it can do. The options for off-the-shelf frameless motors are pretty limited, so these aren't the best suited for this task. But a working robot wasn't really the goal here. I don't even want to use wood screws to mount my motors. But a couple of machine screws on the top and bottom? That could go in line with a clock cage gearbox, or act as a structural post for a drone with arms on the top and bottom. I'm sure the comments will be full of even cooler applications. I would love to see static core motors become readily available. For now, I guess I'll have to build them myself. Thanks for watching.